back then, we had uh, a, a PC government that came in on the heels of uh, the NDP government that preceded them. And so maybe just for our, uh, our viewers, uh, talk a little bit about what these people are walking into. There's going to be a new cabinet sworn in probably in about three weeks. They'll be staffed up. There's a transition team in place uh, now. Um, what, what sorts of things are, are they going to be looking for? What will they be doing their first days uh, on the job? First days will be about, uh, I think, establishing a tone for this government and laying out some of their priorities. Obviously, they had uh, five fairly simple but large priorities that they campaigned on. Those will be the center of that. And the, you know, the transition team has a number of jobs. It, it has to look after how the new government presents itself even before there is a cabinet. They have to start the work of uh, helping to pick who's going to be in cabinet because I think Mr. Ford will be looking for some advice in that regard. And of course, his, his close staff, his campaign staff, and the transition team will work, uh, be working very hard on that. And then they'll have to, as they pick a cabinet, uh, work on things like uh, what's, what's become the sort of de rigueur or the, or the norm these days with governments is typically their mandate letters that get developed and provided to new cabinet ministers and to their staff, which are the instructions of what they, uh, the premier and the premier's office expects to be carried out. Um, then there's also the work of, of starting to establish um, a relationship and, a, and an approach and work with the civil service who have been you know, busy these last couple of months knowing that there would be some type of transition, maybe to, you know, to the former government uh, had they won the election, but regardless there was going to be change. So they've been tasked with preparing for that change, being ready to brief new ministers, their staff, being ready to present some policy options that will reflect what the priorities were of Mr. Ford and, and the PC party during the election and how the, those policy options might fit with those priorities. Right, and I would add it, it seems to be something that maybe we've imported from south of the border, but there's an increased importance attached to the first 100 days. Mm -hmm. So the government will want to be seen as hitting the ground running revisiting some of the themes that uh, Doug Ford articulated during the campaign, uh, making life more affordable, cleaning up the hydro mess, et cetera. I think he'll want to be seen to be taking uh, early action on that. You referenced uh, a cabinet, so the speculation has already begun. I'm, I'll kick it off by saying since, uh, not only because she finished second in their leadership, but I think in the last seven or eight days, I think Christine Elliott was at every event that uh, Doug Ford was at, regardless of where it took place in the province. Uh, safe to say that uh, we can expect Christine in the cabinet? I, I think that's very safe to say. I'd uh, be shocked to see anything otherwise, and I, don't, I would advise against it if anybody suggests <laughs> that they should. Um, you know, there's, there are a lot of factors go into cabinet making. If we take a step back for a second, you, you do look at those leadership rivals and their various, uh, both the capabilities, experience, uh, but also the constituency that they represent, which in cases of, of leadership rivals, there's significant factions within the party that are very sure. loyal to those people. And you want to um, uh, make sure that loyalty is rewarded, that everybody feels like they're part of the movement and part in, inside that big tent, so to speak. And then you have to look beyond that at people's various experiences, their life experiences and capabilities. Um, their geography, uh, because I'm sure there'll be a, 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 a geographic representation across the country since the PCs won seats in basically every part of the province. Um, so they'll start to take all of those factors into consideration and certainly we can talk about people, but it's going to be, I think, a, a healthy mix of some of the leadership rivals, some of the other bright lights that he had around the table when he showcased the team about two weeks ago. I think there was a bit of a a turning point in the approach in the campaign. Yeah. Dick Fidelli, Lisa McLeod, Carolyn Mulroney, Peter Bethenthal, the, um, um, some of the some of the new candidates as well as some of the existing caucus, and uh, obviously the people that were around that table will have some expectation that they were showcased for a reason, and they've got a good shot at being in cabinet. I, I doubt promises have been made at that point in time. But if I was around that table, I'd be thinking, okay, good. I'm, I'm, I have a really good 
chance at this. I'm, I'm being so. showcased for a reason. Exactly. So it's interesting. You, you touched on it. I, I, I looked at the results from yesterday, and the PCs have elected uh, northern members, rural members, urban members, suburban members. They've elected some pretty strong women. They've elected people from uh, culturally diverse communities. They really do have a lot of options to choose from. I don't, I don't know that there's any particular uh, group or segment of the population that is not uh, reflected. Uh, and there, of course, Ontario has a very, very multicultural uh, population, so it's, it's not to say that every country in the world is represented in the PC caucus, but certainly there is uh, a lot of diversity there, and I, I, in looking at it, uh, there's, there's really no part of the province un uh, shut out, unlike, say, in 2014, where the Liberal uh, caucus was, was pretty urban. It was pretty Toronto, it was pretty Ottawa, it was not particularly rural uh, at all. So uh, in making his cabinet, uh, I guess the other thing I would add is that when, when Doug Ford sought out and won the leadership of the PC party, uh, he initially had the support of one uh, PC MPP, it was Raymond Cho from Scarborough, and then when Patrick Brown fell out the, the, the second time, Toby Barrett from Haldeman Norfolk went to, uh, to Doug Ford, and that's it. There's not a long list of MPPs who will go to him now, who can go to him now and say, hey, I helped put you over the top in the leadership. My expectation is that you put me in cabinet now. Yeah, it's, it's a factor, and I'll, uh, I'll come back to that in, in just a second. I, I think that you know, what you're referring to in terms of diversity, both gender and, and ethnic diversity, there's, he, he has options that other parties maybe haven't had in, in the past because, as you said, winning seats in every part of the province and being quite a, a diverse group of candidates that did win. Um, I also think that there are, there's not a lot of expectation out there in terms of, you know, uh, uh, if we compare it to, say, um, Prime Minister Trudeau winning in 2015, there was already a lot of talk and emphasis on gender diversity and diversity of that cabinet to the, to the point that traditional representation in cabinet from the Italian-Canadian community, for instance, suddenly there was none in, 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 that, in that federal cabinet. Um, I don't think that there's the same kind of expectations on Mr. Ford, but he has the luxury of being able to achieve a lot of those same goals without it being maybe uh, some sort of an explicit quota or an explicit uh, a goal that he has stated he has to achieve. So it, it's a great spot to be in. 